Our New Testament reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. You may find this reading on your blue, in your blue pew Bible on page 194, or in your red pew Bible on page 215. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. But because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Five chapters into this text and five weeks into this sermon series, It should be crystal clear that Christ is at the heart of Hebrews. Jesus is the one raising hope in the lives of the disheartened Hebrew people, who because of persecution, suffering, and even apathy, have a lackluster hold of the faith that they once so strongly professed. The author of Hebrews is holding Jesus up to these people as their diamond in the rough. Not because he's hidden away somewhere, waiting to be found like a long-lost treasure, but because he is hidden in plain sight to them, because of their own blinders and limiting perspectives. It may be a simplistic metaphor, but it is as if the preacher is holding up Jesus to them like a diamond and saying, as a people on the verge of having the same hardened hearts as your ancestors, not only have you lost sight of Jesus, of this diamond, this gift, but you have yet to even discover just how many facets it has to show you. Look carefully. There are so many more aspects of Jesus to discover and to understand. And once you do, you'll realize that the light shining through them is the hope that you are so longing for in your lives. You can't experience the complete wholeness of the hope Jesus has to offer unless you see and experience all of these aspects of him. And so because I know it's summer and we haven't all been here every week, here's a brief review of what we know of Jesus so far. We first met Jesus in Hebrews 1 as an exalted figure sitting at the right hand of God, a reflection of God's glory, an imprint of God's very being. 
Then in chapter 2, we met Jesus as a flesh and blood human walking around on earth, suffering, one who can empathize and sympathize with us. Then in Hebrews 3, we saw Jesus named as God's son, the faithful heir of God's household, that is, of all people in human history, held higher in esteem than even Moses. And now in chapters 4 and 5, we see the intersection of these three facets of Jesus in yet a whole new dimension. Jesus as the great high priest. It's precisely because Jesus sits at the right hand of God in heaven and sits at the right elbows of his disciples and friends breaking bread on earth that Jesus is the great high priest, the great mediator between God and humanity. And that's what a high priest is, a a mediator. Baptists that we are, I'm going to assume that it won't hurt to give a quick refresher on the Levitical priesthood. In essence, the task of a priest is to approach God on behalf of the people, to gather what the people bring, their offerings, their prayers, the symbols of their repentance, their cares, their deepest needs, and to take these offerings into the very presence of God. The priest faces in two directions, toward God on behalf of humanity and toward humanity on behalf of God. When the people needed help and forgiveness from God, the priest took their confessions and sacrifices to God for them, along with his own. And then he returned with a blessing from God for the people, a reminder of their salvation, their wholeness. Priests, as you heard in the scripture, were appointed by God. It was not something that they volunteered for. It was a very important role with guaranteed job security. After all, the people were never going to stop sinning, so the priests were never going to stop sacrificing. But there was a very pastoral dimension to the priesthood, too, because the priests would hear the deep secrets and confessions of the people, and he could sympathize with them as a fellow imperfect human who messed up from time to time. So why then does the preacher of Hebrews call Jesus the great high priest? Well, first of all, it's a term in an office that the Hebrew people would relate to and understand. But there are some more clear distinctions and more significant ones. Jesus is designated by God from the beginning, not appointed. Because of his eternal nature, there's an eternal nature to the message of wholeness and forgiveness and salvation that he brings to the people. In other words, he's a forever priest, not just for their lifetime, but for all of time. Now, we'll get into Melchizedek in future weeks, and I'm sure this will all make more sense to you at that time. But for our purposes today... The most important part of Jesus being the great high priest for the Hebrews is that he understands their suffering. He's a great pastor. He's able to empathize and sympathize with them, bringing their sins and hurts to God while bringing his own cries and laments as well. And the best thing about Jesus as high priest is that his offering, his sacrifice, is once and for all. Will the people keep sinning and needing to confess and restore right relationship with God and with others? Of course. But the gift of forgiveness and the blessing of wholeness or salvation is already theirs. Jesus doesn't have to keep bringing them new blessings of salvation from God because he himself is the source of salvation It is in the person of Jesus that all of the world and all people are made whole. They come together as one. His very life and his love are the blessing. We remember from John 1, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among them. Jesus came as one of the people to bring all the people to him. And so as the great high priest, instead of carrying burnt offerings or animal sacrifices to God, Through his life and death, Jesus carries 
the whole of our human condition to God. Our need, our distress, our pain, our illnesses, our hunger for justice, and our cries for peace. And he takes all of this and he places it boldly before God. It's striking in this passage that while several statements are made about Jesus' learning and his being tested, his suffering and his faithfulness, the strongest image in Hebrews chapter 5 is that of Jesus in fervent prayer with loud cries and tears appealing to the one who was able to save him from death. This image brings to mind Jesus in Gethsemane. The late great preacher Fred Craddock wrote that Jesus' prayers were heard and yet he still suffered, locates Jesus firmly among his brothers and sisters whose experiences are precisely the same. Jesus is facing death, and he cries out to God, just as the rest of us would do. So the reason that Jesus is so great a high priest is because he actually asked God for help, crying out on his people's behalf and on his own. This pastoral dimension of Jesus is so important for the Hebrews to understand. And it's important for us to understand today, too. Jesus is the great high priest, the ultimate mediator between God and humanity, and humanity and God. And he's the ultimate mediator because of how he approaches humanity, with humility, right? Coming down to earth to suffer alongside us, but also how he approaches God with humility, crying out and lamenting the suffering of people. He gets both sides. He understands both angles. So much so that humanity and God can no longer be referred to as two different sides, but they come together and are joined as one in the person of Jesus. Listen again to what a gift this is. This is Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 in the message. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest, with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him And get what he is so ready to give. Let's take the mercy. Accept the help. I was going to preach about how even though it is inherent in Jesus himself and an essential aspect of being a Christian, asking for help seems to be the cardinal sin in our American culture. You know, we champion independence over dependence. Individual success over communal progress. I was going to refer to an article that talked about the assumptions we hold about asking for help that keep us from doing so. Things like we don't want to be a burden to other people, we don't want to be seen as weak, we don't want to let go of control of a situation, and and so on. And these assumptions are fascinating. They have a lot to tell us, I think, about our own individual spiritual growth and lives. But I'm going to save those for another day. Because as the week unfolded, I felt a very different message in my heart arising from this text. A message of healing and reconciliation that comes when we actually allow Jesus to be our great high priest, to be our mediator. A message of hope that can be ours if and only if we actually believe we are the living whole body of Christ. Baptist pastor, the Reverend Amy Butler, is the pastor of New York's Riverside Church. And before I could articulate what I was feeling in my heart, she did. And what she wrote really speaks to how I was feeling. She says, 
Words are insufficient to capture the depth of grief, anger, and despair many of us have felt as we heard the news of this violent act of terrorism, fueled by a shameful legacy of racism in our country. Our prayers and our hearts go out to the families of the nine lives lost, to the congregational, congregation of Emmanuel AME Church, and to the city of Charleston. Tragedies such as these confront us with hard questions. As people of faith, how can we speak words of peace and reconciliation when even our houses of worship cannot provide sanctuary from the violence and hatred in our world? How can we proclaim all lives are cherished and beloved by God when our brothers and sisters are targeted for the color of their skin? How can we hope for a culture of peace and justice when we do not even have the courage to limit the use of deadly weapons in our society? She concludes by saying, our lack of resolve, our collective failure, has created this litany of tragedies. Still though, it is in these moments of despair that we need each other most. We need our churches and our communities to provide comfort, but also to call us to action with the deep conviction of faith. A faith that gives us the courage to speak words of hope in a culture of death, a faith that compels us to work for justice and God's peaceable kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and a faith that assures us that love will win in the end. With all of these thoughts in my mind and heart, the question that kept coming to me from this text was, what does Jesus, being our high priest, have to teach us about how we live and move and have our being in this world. I think a lot. To see Jesus as our high priest is to see Jesus as a connecting point, a bridge between humanity and God, and Lord knows we need that in our country right now. As an American people, we have sinned and fallen short of our created and intended potential and so we seek forgiveness from God, and we seek forgiveness from our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who we have hurt. But the thing about Jesus as high priest, about him being the mediator and bridge from us to God, is that because he is fully human, he gets us in full. And he fully represents us to God. And because he's fully divine, he gets God. And he fully represents God and the fullness of God's love to us. If that's true, what would it be like for us to allow the life and love of Jesus to be our mediator and connecting point between races in our country? To see one another through Jesus' eyes. To see our fullness of humanity. To see ourselves as the person across the table from us, to actually believe that we are them and they are us? What would it look like for us to realize that we are not the broken and bloody bodies that our country accept and allow, but that in God's kingdom, we are one healed humanity, one body of Christ, equal before God and before one another? Can we have the courage to let Christ mediate our racial biases and our prejudices to propel our country from conversations about race to actual actions of reconciliation? Hebrews 5, 7 says that Jesus cried out in pain and wept in sorrow as he offered prayers to God. What we learn here from Jesus is that as long as humanity is suffering and sinning, as long as there is pain and death and racism and hatred and terrorism and mental illness and political fights over flags, as long as these things prevail, there must be loud cries pouring out from our mouths and prayers that are soaked with our tears. There is no other way. But why else do we need him to be our high priest and mediator? Because we don't know how to talk to one another. 
across party lines, across race lines, across religion lines. We don't know how to sit down as communities and put language around systemic racism. And so instead, we live in the illusion that we can face these faults on our own, I think. But we can't do this. Our hearts are hardened with denial. Our vision is blinded with years of looking at our own needs. And so we're wandering in this wilderness like the Israelite ancestors, and we're killing ourselves, literally. Haven't we proven yet, time and time again, that whatever we're doing now is not working? This is why we need Jesus as our interpreter across divides that seem impossible. We need Jesus as our Prince of Peace, who came and suffered and sacrificed for all people, not just people of certain colors or races. Jesus is the great high priest for all people for all time. No exceptions. And if this is the Jesus in which we profess our faith, and the Jesus that we know we need in our lives and in the world, then why aren't we following him? Why do we keep trying to do things our own way? Why are we not looking to Jesus for help? Here's what I mean by that. Why do we see Jesus' peaceful ways and still think that violence is the answer? Why do we see Jesus sitting down with people of differing perspectives and still think we can only hang out with and talk to people who think and believe like us? How can we hear Jesus say that loving God and loving others are the two most important commandments of all and then just keep on loving ourselves more and more? It is way past time for us to look to Jesus, to be our high priest, to be the one who is guiding our lives. We must realize that wholeness and salvation have already come in Christ. It feels like we're living in a Good Friday world, But the good news is we are resurrection Christians. We are the risen body of Christ at work in the world. And so how can we go from living like people under this Levitical priesthood, having to offer sacrifice after sacrifice, prayer after prayer, for death after death, sin after sin, to living as a people under Jesus' priesthood, believing in the power of his love and his life to truly unharden our hearts Believing that his suffering and his sacrifice allows us to approach God and to approach one another with boldness, mercy, and grace. One thing is for sure. We can't be afraid to ask for help. To look to one another and to Jesus for answers. And you know, the interesting thing is, is that our African-American brothers and sisters are not afraid to ask for help. They're pleading for our help. It's not that they're helpless, not at all. It's that our silence is not only not helping, it's harming. Will we act like the Christ that we say we follow and cry out with bold laments? Will we be agents of reconciliation, bridges of hope, and mediators of our broken humanity to one another and to God? I close with this prophetic message from Iva Carruthers. She is the General Secretary of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, an interdenominational faith group focused on social justice. And she spoke this week at a luncheon for the New Baptist Covenant. Her words hit at the heart of our call as Christians. The Charleston Church Massacre is not a problem of gun violence or even of racism. Rather, it uncovers a spiritual sickness afflicting the American soul. The challenge in America is one of soul lockdown, S-O-U-L. A spiritual and moral malady blinding the nation to systemic racism and other entrenched attitudes that inspire events like Wednesday's shooting. This soul lockdown, she says, limits the movement and perception of truth 
and confines the outward flow of God's breath. None of us can breathe in society, she says, anymore. The prescription for this is something akin to the ancient African notion of Ubuntu, she says, which means my humanity is bound up in your humanity. Her question for us is, will the church lead? Gary Simpson, the pastor of Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, agreed with her, saying, we've got to tell the truth, even if it's painful. The church must take the lead in this movement. Thy kingdom come, right, he says. This is our singular call, thy kingdom come. We pray it every week in our churches. We need to live it every day. The reason Jesus is at the heart of Hebrews is because the preacher, the author, can't find enough ways to remind his people of who Jesus is in their lives and what he means for the world. We need just as many reminders as they did. We too are a disheartened people. But I firmly believe that Jesus is the one raising hope in our lives. We must let him be our high priest. We must allow Jesus to be the bridge between our broken humanity and between our broken hearts and the heart of God. May we not be afraid to ask for help as we seek to be part of the hard work of reconciliation in our country. When we admit that we need help, the healing begins. Lord, in your mercy. Amen.